let me share with you some of our concerns and I think we need to continue this dialogue in a more structured manner in the future. But as um, I'm, I'm, I'm of course appreciative of the fact that you've given me this rare opportunity to highlight my uh, position on these issues. Some are uh, deemed to be extremely contentious uh, and in the light of uh, media control and, uh, and to say, enmity towards us, there's always a danger when you deal with the issues of religion or race. But since uh, you have encouraged me to be more courageous, take more risks, <laughs> so let me share with you some of my concerns. I've given very serious thought to the views of all sides concerned, and today I want to reach out again with a renewed message. It is a message of overwhelming conceived with many towards none, but charity for the entire nation. And together with my friends and colleagues here this evening, a message raised on the pedestal of faith and hope, not on the ashes of despair and gloom. In this blessed month of Ramadan, we want this to be a message for all of us, including myself, to take home and share with our family, our loved ones, our neighbors and friends, so that we may move this nation forward to greater cohesiveness. For the past several years, in the, and in particular since the last 18 months or so, incident after incident, circumstance after circumstance, has been occurring as it indeed cause for deep concern. Collectively, these developments threaten to undermine our cohesiveness as a nation and they bite away the very fabric that keeps us united. These are not isolated cases or random occurrences touching on superficial issues. Nor are they mere events or developments happening on the fringe perpetrated by insignificant groups. On the contrary, what we are witnessing is a systematic and wholesale attempt by prominent entities to take this nation to the brink. In the consequence of this race baiting, they are adding fuel to the fire by fomenting increasing polarization, recklessly spreading the disease of incitement to religious intolerance and hatred. For those using religion to incite hatred, let them be reminded of Allah's commandment in Surah Hud 112. So remain on the right course as you have been commanded, you and those who have turned back with you to Allah, and do not transgress. transgress. Make no mistake, Muslims are not the only ones to be hold to take the path of moderation, to be told to take the path of moderation. The admonition against extremism in religion or using it to incite ill will and violence applies to all. In the Bible, the book of Hosea, 8 9, we read, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. Indeed, we are a multiracial, multi religious, multicultural, and multi religious nation, but that is not a cause for despair or mistrust. On the contrary, it is a cause, it is a cause for all of us to reach out for each other. In Surah Al Hajurat, Al Hujarat, verse 13. Allah reminds us not just Muslims but the entire human race. The call is Ya Ayyuhan Nas, O mankind. Indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. The most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Now, in order to foster a culture not just of tolerance but of amity and inclusivity, the powers that be must ensure that the federal constitution may, given, may be given pride of place. I'm pleased the Bar Council Chief is here. So I think this is very pertinent and equally your, of your central concern. The constitution is not just a piece of paper couched in legal jargon. It is a sovereign charter of rights 
freedoms, responsibilities, duties, and the rules of governance of a nation. It did not come about through rancorous debate or an acrimonious war of words. It came into existence as a result of the social compact of our leaders representing the diverse communities in this country of ours. It guarantees our right to life and liberty, to freedom of speech, assembly and association. It prescribes equality of all citizens before the law and guarantees freedom of religion. And as I've said before, these fundamental liberties forming the bedrock of our identity as a nation must be respected by all communities, be they the majority or the minorities. Politicians, whether in power or in the opposition, must strive to honor them in word and deed. Above all, the judiciary must ensure that these safeguards remain sacrosanct. I would like to reiterate our position that we oppose all measures and actions that violate the freedom of religion so well entrenched in the federal constitution and also safeguarded by Islam. In this regard, the commentary by the late Sheikh Muhammad Al-Ghazali on Surah Al-Kafiru, Lakum Dinukum Wal Yadid. According to him, the Surah lays down one of the most fundamental principles in international relations. One, the recognition of all religious faith. And two, the promotion of good neighborliness and constant dialogue. We are hardly here this type of discourse in this country. Secondly, it must be re a reasoned discourse, guided not by emotive sentiments, but by rational arguments. We cannot frame the polemics of statehood and governance purely from the bifurcation of Islamic State versus secularism. An enlightened discourse from the Islamic perspective must entail consideration in respect of the form and content of Islamic governance where labels and slogans are now considered passing. Indeed, one must go behind the facade and analyze the constituents, what is considered ideal Islamic governance. I would like to reiterate the position of Pakat al on the question of the Sharia and Hulud is one, of the, one to be based on consensus. And in this regard, the component parties have agreed to disagree while remaining firm to the commitment of ensuring the establishment of a just and equitable society for the nation, regardless of race and religion. On Hudud, Sheikh Qardawi asserts that before the Prophet implemented Hudud, the prerequisite was to ensure that the Muslim community, Muslim community must be well and fully prepared for it by having reached the level of advancements in aspects of faith, religious laws, morals, ethics, and values. He maintains that other laws pertaining to Islam should be implemented first before the implementation of Hudud, which is not top priority, according to his list of fiqh awlawiyat, according to priorities, especially when other crucial matters pertaining to the Ummah remain unresolved. This categorization clearly shows that Hudud law is but one constituent of the vast corpus of the Sharia, and not, as some parties would suggest, the be-all and all of Islamic law. On the contrary, as stated by Akhradawi, Hudud law occupies the bottom rung in the overall scheme of the implementation of the Sharia. It remains to be said that this discourse is not about placing Hudud in a less than favorable light, but rather that Akhradawi's view is part and parcel of his jurisprudence of priorities, where the principles of high objectives of the Sharia, maqasid of the Sharia, warrant that matters of importance of the community should be ordered according to priorities. Consequently, the implementation of Hudu being lower in the hierarchy of priorities cannot supersede the attainment of the high objectives, objectives of the Sharia, which includes sanctity of life and property, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, and of course, justice for all. The Taliban claims that they want Sharia law as ordained in the Quran and in their book, Education for Girls and Cat Fly al Haram. Before that, Sudan ordained Sharia as the law of the land. 
and we did not reinvent the wheel to show what the basket case of Sudan has been. One declared by the international community as a failed state. Not necessarily because of the application of the Sharia, but because of corruption and poor governance. Similarly, the ardent advocates of secularism should not be too quick to judge. They should try to understand that the rationale behind the skepticism among Muslim societies on account of the fact that many of the countries under secular rule are also essentially dictatorships or autocracies notorious for corruption and gross abuse of human rights. Mustafa Kemal established Turkey as the first Muslim secular state, adopting an exclusively secular policy at the expense of the religion. But he was by no means a democrat, and his secular policies written into the constitution did not come about via democratic process was imposed top down by the military. In the history of modern Islam, there has been no secular leader who was in any sense a democrat. Sukarno, Jamal Nasser, Saddam Hussein, Hafiz Assad, Husni Mubarak, all, all were secular and all were dictators. The issue, therefore, is not whether we are secular or Islamic, but whether we are democratic or not democratic. In this equation, the question of freedom and injustice loom large. Issues of governance are paramount. Rather than being obsessed with labels, we need to ensure that there are policies that move the nation forward, not set the nation backwards. We are in full agreement that we want democracy. Perhaps we may differ on how we lay stress on the name. Some prefer secular democracy, and yet some wish to call it Islamic democracy. In both of them, Justice and freedom remain paramount. These are not shades of differentiation. I'm hopeful that they will not prevent us from working in unison for the common cause, as has been proven time and again, as in, for example, the largely, immensely popular and successful Bersit 1, 2, and 3. As a Muslim, I'm profoundly concerned with the painful suffering of the Muslim Ummah in the Middle East. Today you are saying continuous bombardment of Gaza, killing women, children, destruction, all. And of course, it's probably general muted response from the Muslim world. And there are problems confronting us in South Asia. But there has been instances what we consider and take with some degree of pride in the successes of democratic reform. We are witnessing the Indonesian presidential elections today for pronounced and free and fair uh, compared to the election commission in Malaysia. And of course, the democratic reform made in Turkey. Tunisia is as yet a fledging democracy. <coughs> Nevertheless, a significant number of Muslim countries are still in the grip of dictatorship and authoritarian rule, signified by rampant corruption and abuse of power, and some are branded as failed states. Grinding poverty, high levels of illiteracy, and unemployment, extremely low standards of living, and gross inequities in income distribution. These are the stark realities of much of the Muslim world of the 21st century. The time has come for a new democratic movement on a global scale to mobilize resources and efforts to spearhead this democratization in the Muslim world. In this regard, I've initiated together with colleagues <coughs> from Tunisia, Turkey, Indonesia, and Japan, World Forum for Muslim Democrats. The primary goal is to establish a common platform for leaders, intellectuals, professionals, of the Islamic faith, faith to articulate their progressive views on matters pertaining to freedom, democracy, and justice. But what is pertinent to raise here is that the forum will be inclusive of the multifarious political and religious persuasions in order to promote greater understanding and dynamics in this course. Friends, in working towards a cohesive Malaysia, we must stay focused on the things that really matter to us as a nation. These are issues of governance, 
transparency, accountability. Our ultimate goal is full constitutional democracy, not on paper, but in practice, where justice and freedom prevail, and the rule of law supersedes the rule of men and also women judges. We must strive for greater productivity, robust economic growth, better education, healthcare and housing, and higher living standards for all, subsumed under a humane economy where social justice is paramount. Thank you.